Well, the sad condition of human nature was on full display in Charlottesville, Virginia last weekend. And it appears that many came to that rally, both the protesters and the counter-protesters. They came prepared to act violently, and they did. What we're told is that it was all about these statues commemorating a very sad and tragic era of our history. And so across our nation, especially in southern states, sometimes in the dead of night, statues are being pulled down left and right. Since the Charlottesville attack last weekend, the statue of a, a Confederate soldier in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, they used ropes to pull him to the ground. And then here in Baltimore, the mayor had, in the middle of night, at great taxpayer's expense, I understand, removed all of uh, the Confederate monuments in Baltimore. The other Confederate monuments uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, were covered up so no one could see them. Supposedly, these statues were told represent racism, represent oppression of blacks in our country. But it's sad, the great ignorance of the protesters and ignorance of the journalists and ignorance of the politicians. For example, the statue of Robert E. Lee was one uh, of great uh, debate there in Charlottesville and the claim that uh, the statue of Robert E. Lee means that he was a racist. It means they obviously do not know the history of Robert E. Lee that Robert E. Lee emancipated the slaves that came into his family by inheritance. He never purchased them. They came into his family, and he in emancipated those slaves. All the while, the general he ultimately surrendered to at Appomattox, Ulysses S. Grant, had purchased a slave. Yes, he did ultimately set that slave free, but there were slaves that his family inherited, and during the war, his family was being served by slaves. So the war was about slavery? Wait a minute. The northern general was a slave owner. What's with this? It was not about slavery, but we've been well lied to nonetheless. And the uh, idea of the ignorance of the mob is added to by the ignorance of the press and the ignorance of all the academic institutions in our land and it knows no end. They have lied to the American people again and again and again. But if it really is about racism, if it really is about the oppression of blacks in our society, we ought to consider the person, the person who has done the most harm to blacks in our country, bar none. And this person has a very prominent bust in her honor there in Washington, D.C., standing in the National Portrait Gallery, Gallery. That museum has Margaret Sanger and her bust as part of the Struggle for Justice exhibit. Justice? What kind of justice does she stand for? The sign beneath the sculpture says that Sanger was profoundly affected by the physical and mental toll exacted on women by frequent childbirth, miscarriage, and self-induced abortion, and therefore she's some hero of justice according to them. Well, wisely, a group of black pastors has protested this. They've asked the Smithsonian repeatedly to remove Margaret Sanger from that place because she is no champion of justice. Rather, she is a hater of the black race. And she, through the eugenics movement, sought to eliminate blacks from our country. The Smithsonian, however, has responded to the demand and refused to remove the bust of Margaret Sanger. And they say that uh, her support of eugenics was all part of justice in the land. And so they have rejected the request defending the inclusion of Sanger in their exhibit of justice. But the pastors say they're not dissuaded. They will continue because they claim, and rightly so, that Margaret Sanger was a racist who wanted to end the black population in America through birth control and through abortion. And they have evidence that this is exactly the case. So how ironic. The leftist protesters are saying it's all about racism. They have to pull down all these statues. And yet most of them honor Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. And this isn't the first time that pastors have requested the removal. Back in 2015, not only pastors, but 25 House Republicans campaigned to have that bust removed from the Smithsonian Institution National Portrait Gallery and... Ted Cruz, for example, he's offered this in a press release explaining why he was opposed to her being there. She doesn't belong there for a number of reasons, the most damning of which is her part in, the inhumane, in her inhumane life's work, the 
an advocation for the extermination, Ted Cruz's words, not mine, extermination of African Americans. And Ben Carson, an African American himself, proclaimed that Sanger believed that people like me, black people, should be eliminated. Herman Cain, who ran for president a while back, he also said that Margaret Sanger was about killing black babies before they came into this world. Now, many people, when they hear that, say, that's outlandish. No, Margaret Sanger never said any such thing. Well, let's look at her own words, what she said. And I quote, We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities, the most successful educational approach, that is, convincing them of abortion and birth control. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We do not want to, the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Her words, not mine, exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members, end quote. Could it be, she said she was looking for ministers, could it be that she found just such one minister in Martin Luther King Jr.? Consider this, in 1966, Martin Luther King made it clear that he agreed with Margaret Sanger's life work and that he believed her life work was anything but inhumane. In 1966, King received the Planned Parenthood Margaret Sanger Award in Human Rights and he praised her contribution to the black community. He said, and I quote, there is a striking kinship between our movement, the Civil Rights Movement, and Margaret Sanger's early efforts. What? Margaret Sanger wants to eliminate the black population and Martin Luther King is in line with that? If that's the case, why haven't they pulled his statue down in Washington, D.C.? Haven't heard anybody calling for that. Martin Luther King continues, Martin Luther King Jr. Margaret Sanger had to commit what was then called a crime. It is a crime, the murder of the unborn. What was then called a crime in order to enrich humanity. Again, those are King's words, not mine. Enrich humanity, and today we honor her courage and vision. Wow, it appears... I don't know the facts, whether she actually hired him or not, but she awarded him in 1966 with one of their highest accolades from Planned Parenthood. Very disturbing. Let me quote another Margaret Sanger statement. She wrote this, cultivation of the better racial elements in our society, by which she, of course, meant the whites and not the blacks, and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extirpation, the big fancy word which means extermination, extirpation of defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. She wanted to exterminate blacks, and it's quite clear. She said the most merciful thing the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. That's Margaret Sanger and her evil spawn. Well, the coalition of black pastors have called again, this time, a second time, for uh, the uh, National Portrait Gallery, Gallery to take down her uh, bust, but they have refused again. And they wrote a letter specifically citing the black genocide that uh, Margaret Sanger wanted to see. The fact that Margaret Sanger spoke to Ku Klux Klan rallies because Ku Klux Klans were in the same mindset as Margaret Sanger. The fact that she was connected with Hitler sympathizers because Hitler had the same eugenics plan in Germany, eliminate all the undesirable races and the human weeds. The project that, uh, that she was the brainchild of was called the Negro Project. You can look this up, Planned Parenthood Negro Project and it sought to limit, if not eliminate, black births in America. It was her brainchild. And so it's staggering when you consider what's taking place in America and the lies that we are being told and the truth that is being suppressed. Sanger advocated, like Hitler, the elimination of a whole race of people as undesirables. And instead of being denigrated and rejected, society continues to honor her somehow as a hero. Has she been successful? Margaret Sanger has been wildly successful. More blacks are aborted in New York City today than are born in New York City. That's the New York Department of Health report. 
and the uh, Center for Disease Control reports that black women, although they only compose 11% of the population, they compose 36% of the abortions in our land. More than 18 million black babies have been aborted in their mother's wombs. If those babies were alive today, the black population in America would be more than double what it currently is. So Sanger's Planned Parenthood has suppressed the black vote more effectively than poll taxes, than literacy tests, than voter ID, or even more than the Ku Klux Klan altogether. And so, why is she still honored? And why are gatherings held yearly to give awards in her name? It's because people love what she stood for. They love that murder. And she is not alone among the leaders in the abortion movement that are being honored. There is, if you go to Annapolis today, a statue of a man who is, by all accounts, part of that same black genocide. He is former Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, radically pro-abortion. He voted in Roe v. Wade to murder babies and even demanded after that public funding for more black genocide. But the airport here is named after him now. And there's a statue in front of the legislative buildings in Annapolis of Thurgood Marshall, and no one is calling to tear his statue down. Rather, in the dead of night this past Monday, the governor of Maryland, using taxpayers' dollars, had the Supreme Court Justice statue of Roger B. Taney removed from where it had stood for 145 years because he was the author of the Dred Scott case. It basically said black slaves have no constitutional rights. And yet they continue to let a man this statue stand that is responsible for the murder of 60 million babies, 18 million of which were black babies. It is still there, an author of black genocide, and no one is calling to tear it down. We have been deceived. We have been lied to. What's taking place is using this stalking horse of racism to really bring about what they actually want, a communist revolution by violent means in our land. When we examine the roots of violence, it is very clear. If your Bible is open, turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. We know that Scripture speaks of man's fallen condition, man's sinful state, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans uh, 3.23. And because we are fallen and sinful, one of the aspects, one of the uh, results of that sinfulness is a tendency towards violence, particularly with those who have less self-control. And Jesus identified the parentage of unbelievers when they expressed their violent desire to him, they express, expressed to him they wanted to kill him. And here's how Jesus responded when they talked about killing him. John 8 and verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil. Let me pause right there. Because you commonly hear among people today when they say, well, we're all God's children. Jesus said that was not true. That was a lie. He said this group of people confronting him, this people violently wanting to kill him, he said they were of their father, the devil. It is not true that all human beings are children of God. It's true that they were all created by God and they were all created in the image of God. But it is not true that they are all children of God. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. So Jesus identified the violent attitudes in the people who surrounded him, who ultimately crucified him. These were that same gang of people that hated him so much they wanted him dead. That violent response was because they were of their father, the devil, and they were doing the bidding of their father, the devil. So violence and murder and lies, all of these are the works of the devil. And people who do these works demonstrate who they belong to. They demonstrate who their father truly is. We see that, not only in Charlottesville, but other places around the country. 
where people intending to inflict pain, people intending to act violently enter into a melee. So I believe the president was right in his first response that said there was violence on both sides and those violent actions were condemned. If you're there in John 8, just turn two pages over to John 10 and verse 10 because Jesus basically says in John 10, 10, the children follow their father. If you're of the father of the devil, this is what the, the devil does. John 10 and verse 10. Jesus says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Quite a contrast between Jesus coming to give abundant life and the devil coming to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so when we see people killing, stealing, destroying, acting violently, we know where that comes from. And so the question is, what is the cure for the violence that we see in our land? That cure comes from the Word of God. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 3. In the very last verse of Titus chapter 3, verse 15, as we close our series in the, in the epistle of Titus, we look at these closing salutations of Paul that he gives to Titus, and in this, there is the key to the cure of violence. It might not appear at first as we read it, but look at what Paul writes uh, to his disciple Titus. 3.15, all that are with me salute thee, that is, greet thee. Greet them that, that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. You recall from our study several weeks ago that the Apostle Paul had traveled to Spain and done some evangelistic work there and then come to the island of Crete and evangelized through the island of Crete and ultimately traveled from Crete back to the mainland, Crete, the island in the middle of the Mediterranean, traveled back to the mainland to the city of Miletus, modern-day Turkey. And from there, he wrote this epistle and sent it back to Titus on the island of Crete. And the tensions and the dislike between the Cretans, those who live on the island of Crete, and the people on the mainland, modern-day Turkey, is ancient. Their hatreds are long-lived, as many of the hatreds in, in the Mediterranean basin are. I have uh, some folks I know that are from Greece, that is, that's what their heritage is, and they have a visceral hatred towards the Turks because of much in their history between the Turks and the Greeks. And the hatreds between the Cretans and those in Miletus were very clear. But notice what Paul says. The people here with me, here in Miletus, they send their love. They send their greetings. They send their blessings. Why? Because these are people who have been transformed by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of Christ broke down the divisions that existed from ancient times. It dissolved those ancient hatreds that existed between these people groups. You see, when there is racial hatred on both sides, such as is brewing today, it is not a new problem. In fact, it's a problem you say can go all the way back to Cain and Abel. Cain hated his brother Abel enough to take up a rock and to kill his brother there in the field. The reality is, it's not a new problem. But the reality of what Paul is expressing here is that when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, everything changes in their life. And one of the things that changes is ancient hatreds that they might have towards a person of a different skin color or a person of a different uh, uh, cultural background. Those ancient racial hatreds are done away with because a Christian cannot be a racist. Why? We are commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that includes those of any racial or cultural background. We are to love and not hate our neighbor. This is what we are commanded to do. And particularly as Christians, we're commanded to show uh, not only love, but we are to do all good, especially to those of the household of faith. Those who are fellow Christians, no matter the cultural difference between Miletus and Crete, does not matter for the Christian. We are to love one another as we are all in the same household of faith. When God adopts us into his family as his son or as his daughter, he adopts us in with all his other sons and daughters into the same family. And so there is to be among Christians a loving relationship that, that transcends any boundaries or any barriers that may have exist, existed before. Because basically we all come in the same condition. 
We all come receiving God's mercy and God's grace that He has shown to us abundantly. And out of gratitude for having received that grace, we then show that mercy and we show that grace to all who are in the household of faith. All the saints have been adopted by the same Father into the same family. You see, as a band of brothers and sisters in Christ, we recognize that we are sinners and we know that we have violated God's law. We were worthy of damnation before God reached out in His grace to us. And have repented, having repented and having renounced our sins, we receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And you see, that makes all the difference. And one of those sins, obviously, is hatred of others based upon differences. You see, there is no significant differences now between us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. With our hearts transformed, transformed from hatred of others to love of others, from anger towards others to mercy towards them. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 26, because I know some might say, well, wait a minute, there's differences between us as Christians, and those differences, they add up to a lot. They're very significant. Notice what Paul says here, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, speaking about uh, human divisions that are based upon race or human divisions based on socioeconomic status or on age or any other divisions that might exist between us or differences as Christians. Notice what he says, Galatians, 6, or, uh, Galatians 3 and verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Just as we mentioned earlier, Jesus said there was a whole section of humanity that are of their father the devil. It's only those who come to faith in Christ that are children of God. And that's what it says here. So all the saints, all the believers, you're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And that was, we think of the racial divisions in society today. This was a huge racial division in their day. Jews would not only have nothing to do with Gentiles, they didn't want to be touched by a Gentile. They would never enter the house of a Gentile. They'd never sit and eat a meal with a Gentile because they believed they were spiritually defiled to have any interaction with a Gentile. And so to talk about separation and, 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 and prejudice, it was enormous. And notice what God says here in His Word. When we come to faith in Christ, all that's done away with. There is no difference any longer racially between Jew and, and Greek. It's no longer of any significance. And then He goes on to say, Neither is there any bond or free. And here's another huge difference that in their world was enormous. Slavery was very well known. And the population of slaves in Rome might have been a third of the people were slaves. So a huge number of slaves. Many slaves came to faith in Christ. And next week we're going to study, start our study in the book of Philemon that answers biblically what about slavery. You know, and that's an important topic. It seems in the minds of a lot of people today. So we'll look at that uh, uh, beginning next week. But... There was enormous numbers of slaves, but when they came to faith in Christ, they were no longer considered slaves. They were equal with those who were free men. There was no division based upon their socioeconomic status as bond or free. And then he said, neither as male nor female. And again, we need to understand in their culture, women were denigrated. Women were put on a lower plane. Women were discriminated against as part of the culture especially the Jewish culture, that if you read some of the prayers, one of the Pharisees' prayers was, God, I thank you that I was not born a woman, and it uh, goes on from there. But their attitudes were wrong. And God was saying when they came to faith in Christ, these divisions that had existed and were significant before coming to Christ were no longer of any significance at all. You see, when we are redeemed by Christ, we become one in Him. And what unites us in Christ is greater than any of the differences that existed before we came or differences that exist after we come to Christ. Yes, there will be differences between us. Obviously, there are differences. But those differences are less significant than the, same, the, the unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The false narrative that we hear in our culture today is that the problem of racism and the problem of hatred that we see so clearly displayed can be cured by one more government program, can be cured by billions of more dollars poured into that empty, worthless hole of the public government-run education system. That indoctrination system somehow will cure racism. It hasn't done it so far, and trillions of dollars will never 
accomplish that. It's a big lie. Because the problem can only be dealt with by the transformation of the hearts of individuals. It can only be done by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so what America needs today is not one more government program, not trillions more in that indoctrination system called the public school system. No. What is needed is repentance from our sins. What is needed is a revival and a return to the Word of God. What is needed is the true gospel of Jesus Christ and people saved and brought into the family of God and they repent of their attitudes of violence and attitudes of racism and attitudes of hatred. These are the things that will transform the hearts of men from hatred to love. And you know that God has a plan. This ultimately is going to be worked out by His plan. If you have your Bible, turn to Colossians 1. Colossians 1 and verse 19 tells us what the future holds. It tells us what God is working towards. This is going to happen. It's not a potential. It is a guarantee that when God has promised it's going to happen, it will happen. And so we, as His people, need to look to this future and not even be discouraged by what we see around us today. Notice what Colossians 1.19 says. For please the Father, that in Him, that is in Christ, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, that is by Christ, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. God is calling out a people to Himself, you and I, as we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we are the vanguard of this future vision when everything is reconciled to Jesus Christ. Every creature, every part of creation, and every being in His kingdom will be fully reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why it is wrong today for Christians to say, I am unreconciled to this other Christian over here because of their culture, because of their language, because of their race, or whatever I want to say it is. No, that's wrong. We are to be reconciled now because that's the future. That's what God is working towards. We will all be in this future full and ultimate reconciliation of all things to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important today for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to keep the bond of peace in the love of the Holy Spirit because we are one through the reconcil reconciling blood of Jesus Christ. We are one with one another through faith in Christ. So those who were at odds with one another in Miletus versus Crete, they're now sending greetings of love and blessing because they know they are one in Christ and those previous divisions between them are of no significance whatever. Think of the ludicrousness of racism because it claims that the melanin content in your skin is something so significant that we need to fight about it, we need to spray mace in people's eyes, and we need to, you know, create violent riots because of the melanin content in people's skin. It's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Yes, there are differences that exist, but for Christians, those differences are so minor because of what we have and what we, are, uh, what we have become by you, by entering the body of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is His kingdom that we are fighting for. It is His kingdom that we are seeking to advance. It is His lordship that we know is going to eventually overtake the entire, entire world. What Paul was dealing with and in his address to those believers there in Crete is the reality that there were false brethren in their midst. Let's see how he helps them understand in Galatians 2, 4, this whole idea of false brethren in the midst. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul says, that, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily, that is secretly, to spy out our liberty which we have in Jesus Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. Satan's strategy back in that day in the first century has not changed one bit at all. Paul recognized that Satan had emissaries, Satan had servants that would come into the church of Jesus Christ. They would pretend to be Christians. Uh, they would carry on as if they were, but they had an entirely different agenda than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to lead people back into a legalistic bondage. They wanted people not to be free in the glorious liberty of the children of God. And these Judaizers 
We're committed to making converts in the church and leading people back to bondage of the liberty of, in, in Christ. And Paul fought them in every town in which he preached the gospel. Paul was opposed by them in every church that he established uh, across the Middle East, across the Mediterranean. How shall we know if there are false brethren in our midst? Turn back, if you would, to Titus 3.15 because Paul gives us a clue of two keys that help distinguish these secret agents of Satan who might invade the church and be working for Satan rather than working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he says there, the key phrase uh, there in, in Titus 3.15 where he gives them two standards. He says, those who love us in the faith. Greet those who love us in the faith. So he's saying back there in Crete, You've got two categories of people. There's those who love us in the faith. But the first standard is love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Love for the true brethren. Satan's secret agents are not truly Christians. They may learn the Christian lingo, and so they sound like Christians. They may play act at worship and so on, but they are not truly Christians. In fact, hate still fills their hearts. They do not have saving faith in, in Christ, and therefore they do not have genuine love for fellow Christians. And Paul faced this everywhere he went. There was people who hated him, they hated him at every turn in every town, tried to kill him, stoned him, you know, all kinds of ways they persecuted him. And Paul learned by the school of hard knocks here that he saw the lack of love for fellow true Christians was a dead giveaway to the false brethren, a dead giveaway to Satan's uh, 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 secret agents in the church. They didn't have a love for fellow believers because they didn't have the Holy Spirit living within them. You know the nine fruits of the Spirit that are spoken of in Galatians 6. It says the very first fruit of the Spirit is love. And if a person has no love in their heart, you have to ask the question, as Paul is saying, are they really a Christian at all? If we're in Christ, the Holy Spirit has begun to produce those fruits in us, the first of which is love. We will love one another. We will love those who are truly other uh, fellow believers in Christ. And that love will manifest itself in many ways, one of which is that we'll be willing to make sacrifices for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Years ago, off the coast of Scotland, a storm was raging in the ocean, and out there in the black and angry waters, a ship had gone to pieces, and uh, there was just a mess left and, and the lifeboat was sent out from the shore and they faced what seemed like a really impossible situation for them to get out and rescue anybody and return safely themselves. It seemed like they were headed into a disaster. But they made it. They made it to the shipwreck and they were able to bring all but one of the sailors back with them. They took all they could but if they added one more it would have sunk the lifeboat they were in. When they came to the shore the leader shouted, there's another man still to be rescued. Uh, we need volunteers for his rescue. These men are exhausted. They cannot go. And so among those stepping forward was a fine young Scotchman, prime of his life. But his white-haired mother came up and put her arms around his neck and said, Don't go, John. Years ago, your father perished in a storm at sea. And you know that just last year, your brother William went to sea and he never came back. And I fear that he has been lost at sea as well. John, you are the only child I have left. And if you should perish, what would I do? Don't go, John. Your mother begs you to stay. Who could resist that kind of appeal? But he took her arms away from his neck and said, Mother, I must go. A man is in peril, and I would feel like a coward not to go. God will take care of us. Let's trust him. He planted a kiss on her cheek and sprang into the lifeboat. And as that boat continued out, it seemed like the storm intensified and Every, every situation that would, that would be dangerous to them. Down in the troughs and up over the waves they went. A whole hour was gone before a sighting of their lifeboat was seen from shore. And as they approached the shore and came back closer within hailing distance, someone from the shore cried, Have you found the man? John in the bow of the boat shouted back, Yes, we saved him. And tell my dear old mother, he is my brother William. What if he had listened to his mother? What if he said, no, no I, I've got to save and protect my own life? Out of love, he was willing to risk his own life, and look what he saved. He saved his own brother. 
You see, as brothers and sisters in Christ, love means we're willing to make sacrifices for one another. And you may wonder, you know, when someone says they love God, uh, how do you measure whether you love God or don't love God? Think of a, a great boiler in the boiler room, and you can't see inside the boiler to see how much water is contained in that boiler, but outside there's this little glass tube that indicates how much water's inside the boiler. And if the boiler's half full, the tube's half full, if the boiler's full, it's, you know, so you know by looking at that tube. Well, God has given us a similar way in which to measure how we love Him. You see, that measure is your love for your brother is the measure of your love for God. And if we love one another, we demonstrate that we truly love God and that we are part of His family. And so this is the measure Paul gave to those believers there on the island of Crete. If you are looking among yourselves and you see those who don't love us, they hate the Apostle Paul, they're not a Christian. They're a false brethren in your midst. That's the first test. The second test is right next to it there. Who love us in the faith. That is, they hold to the essential doctrinal beliefs of the Christian faith. They believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe in the Trinity. They believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. They believe the Bible to be God's word in everything it says, and they follow it. Today in America, there are many preachers who don't hold to that standard. I was hearing about preachers this week that believe sodomite on marriage is a good thing. It's like, what? They must be false brethren. They don't hold to the fact that the Bible condemns that as an abomination and never approves of it, let alone calling it marriage. You see, those who deny the essential Christian doctrines, Paul is saying, rule them as false brethren. Rule them as those who are pretending to be Christians, but they are not. They are not truly in the faith. And then looking at verse 15 again, we see that Paul closes with his benediction of grace on the believers there on the island of Crete. Grace be with you all. When we think about the subject of grace, we realize that this whole epistle began on that theme. Turn back, if you would, to Titus 1. Look at verse 4. Titus 1 and verse 4. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So he starts with his triple blessing and he ends with the blessing of grace. What is it? Grace is God's un merited favor, favor to us. None of us ever deserved anything from God. Only damnation for all have sinned and fallen short. But salvation was His gift of grace. For by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so we have seen this epistle begin with grace and actually this epistle has expounded upon grace several times. Look at chapter 2, Titus 2 and verse 11. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So here, our great salvation was purchased by the grace of God. Christ, in His great love for us, unconcerned for His pain, was willing to suffer on the cross because of God's grace to us. Unconcerned about His own suffering. Very concerned about our lost situation. Reminds me of a train wreck many years ago on a, between Philadelphia and Erie Railroad. And in this collision, Christian Dean was the faithful Christian engineer at the helm there. And he and his firemen were trapped under the wreckage when that train went off the tracks. And they were fastened beneath it such that they could not free themselves. And Dean was held by one of his legs close to the firebox of that engine. His foreman was buried under pieces of the wreckage and when they d were discovered, Dean had managed to reach his toolbox and he was making every effort to try to reach his firemen and rescue his firemen. When the men saw him, they came down to help him and Dean said, no, 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 help poor Jim. Never mind me. And they did. They took the fireman out. He was unconscious. And then they came to Dean to take him out. And they found that during the time that, they'd been working, that he'd been working to relieve his friend, the fire had burned his leg from the knee on down. Burned it to a crisp. So much so that they later had to amputate the lower portion of his leg. Here is this noble fellow, unconcerned about his own pain and suffering, very concerned that his friend, the fireman, be rescued before he was rescued from that disaster. 
And Christ, my friends, has done so much more than that for us. By his death on the cross, he was unconcerned for his suffering, unconcerned for his pain, unconcerned that he was taking upon himself all of our sins by his death on the cross. My friends, that is the grace of God that he has shown to us. And then the grace is further expanded if you turn from Titus 2 to Titus 3 in verse 7. Look at the future hope that we have based upon grace. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Not only do we have eternal life, we are going to inherit all that Christ inherits. And Christ inherits everything. And we are co-heirs with Christ. What a glorious future awaits us because of the grace of Christ. And so it's very appropriate that Paul ends this epistle and closes on the theme of grace. Grace be with you all. Grace, God's grace, God's unmerited, un undeserved favor, he pronounces that blessing on those in Crete, and he pronounces it on you and I. For if we have come to faith in Jesus Christ, confessing that we are sinners without any hope of our own salvation, recognize there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, that Jesus paid it all for us. And we come in humility begging him for his mercy, asking for that gift of salvation, he will answer that prayer and give us His grace. Adopt us as His sons and daughters into His family. Grace be with you all. Amen.